I'm at my healthiest during the holiday season for this chocolate warm. Do you have a lot of What's that? Hey, thanks. Yeah, I was just going to go up. Thank you. Thanks, bud. here I think she might help with the noise mm-hmm. okay that should go have a seat there little friend Hello, hello. So you can see my sound volume right there. And then if I turn it off.
is like an hour ahead in my bedroom work. Uh, it's 15 minutes past the, this one's 15 minutes past and like all the clocks are all different. Yeah. But I know which one is different, but uh, it's so mad because they're all different. We've had a few like that in the house. Mm -hmm. I've had to learn. Yeah, or if you want. Did you guys find the place okay? Yeah. yeah, sometimes it's a little hard to find, so we will have a hard time. Well, let's see, I think we're still about five minutes till go time. We'll give a few more minutes. I know we have a, another person signed up, and then someone else is doing the webinar. So it's kind of our first, our first real. Yeah, so we'll see how well it goes. If this person's like, oh, it was great, or give me my money back, we'll see how it goes. So. Yeah, they can watch me through the computer, and then they can. Kara's going to moderate the chat session there. If if they want to have any questions, they can chat it in, and then she'll uh, ask the questions. You can Skype it. Yeah, the only uh, the only thing I think with Skype, you can do up to like how many people do you know? Yeah, I think you can do up to nine or something, which is good for right now because I've only have one person on there. But the idea is, hopefully, you know, when I, you know, have that, when I fill up auditoriums, you know, when I'm doing, you know, that level. Uh huh. <laughs> so, so this one's actually set up through Google Hangout, so you can actually embed the uh, the YouTube feed in your actual web page, and yeah, and then it records it for you as well, and so give it a whirl, see how it goes. Yeah, we'll give everybody a couple more minutes, and then we'll get started. I think we'll have plenty of workbooks. If somebody wants an extra one, so you're not having to share, you're welcome to grab another one. Somebody want an extra one of you guys? Did you want me to have No, only if they have them. Well, that's why I have the extra list, just in case. Yeah, that's perfect. Do you want another one there, Steve? There you go, man. Yeah. See, you guys are the best sharers. These guys here, it's not very good at sharing. No. <laughs> You get extra points for tonight. Because it matters so much. Is anyone online with us? Just double check. Okay, well, I say we go ahead and. Nope. Yep, we're all there. This is the live.
live feed. Okay, there we go. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I think everybody knows me, and I know you guys, but I'm Jonathan Sherman, and I'm licensed marriage and family therapist, and tonight we're doing the Speaking Manglish and Womanese, Built Bridging the Gender Gap workshop. If you've been to my workshops before, you know I love questions, input, um, throw out ideas, fun, silly, serious, profound, wacky, dumb, whatever, it's all good. All right, so um, as, we, uh, as we talk, I'm going to go through a few basic things, but anything that, that brings in a conversation, don't worry, we're not going to get off track and we're not, we're not worried about covering everything. Through the very questions you bring up, we'll make sure that we cover everything that we need to talk about. Okay. So with that, let me ask you, as you guys were planning on coming here tonight, what is it that you're most hoping that we would cover or that you would get out of it? Maybe you're just wanting just to come and just see what, what, what was presented. But were there any questions in particular that you're hoping we really cover tonight or topics or areas that we went over? Okay. So the question was, and I'm going to repeat questions so that the recording can pick it up and anyone on the webinar can hear because it's the only mic here. So the question is uh, just if there are ways that we can learn how to communicate because it's very common for this couple, as it is for every couple, to miscommunicate or sometimes say one thing and hear another. And that's a lot of what we'll definitely talk about tonight. Okay. Anything else that you guys want to make sure we get out of tonight? All right, okay. Well, that's going to cover it. And if you guys think of anything, just let me know. But let's just jump right into a few things here. Okay. When we're talking about... No, nope. excuse me. We'll edit this part out of the recording. Except we're going to have do a little manual work here. When we're talking about men and women, the question is really because people ask me this a lot: are we are we equal? Are we the same? Or are we different? And the answer is yes to all of them. Okay, we really are. Obviously, we're equal in our rights. We're equal in the fact that we have five fingers. We're equal in our worth. Um, we're equal on so many levels and so many areas. And there's so many things about the male female brain that are identical and that we're, that function the same and that work the same. And so I don't want to get stuck in the common things that happen where we get stuck into the myths and the stereotypes that oftentimes occur. Um, that men and women are inherently different and that it's just they're never going to be able to work together. You know, there's a, a, you know, kind of the Mars and Venus thing, like we're so far apart. And I like Mars and Venus. It's been a really good way for people to understand the male-female way of thinking. Um, but the truth is we're really not that different in the ways that matter the most. But there are some true differences that are neurological, just as we have physical differences. If you guys have noticed, you're different from the man and the man's different from the woman. Do you guys notice the outward differences? You've picked up on that? Okay, good. You guys are doing great. Observation is there. Well, as we're different on the outside, we're also different on the inside. And so while we have a lot of the same things on the outside, we have a lot of the same things on the inside, we have a lot of things that are different on the inside and the outside. Okay, and so we want to really pay attention to those because too often I hear men and women talking about each other as if they were the same. Well, I do it this way. Well, I do it this way. They think they're talking about their own personalities. The truth is what they're talking about are very common and very normal male-female differences that actually are explained a lot in how we're actually made up. Um, but let me ask you this. What are, some of the, what are some of the myths or the stereotypes that you frequently hear about men and women? I mean, how are men? What are the typical things we hear about men? Yeah, they're bad communicators, right? Well, and some of you might be thinking, that's not a myth. That's a reality. <laughs> Okay, all right. So what else? So the bad communicators, poor listeners, all right. All right, what else? We like to be by ourselves. We like to be by ourselves. We're loners, lone wolves, all right. Okay, we like to spend time in that cave, all 
All right. What else? What else do you, do you think about men? It could be, you don't have to be politically correct here. You can say, you know, whatever comes to mind. What are the things you hear about us men? Women, when you talk privately, what do you sigh about and complain about when it comes to men? That men are always right? <laughs> I'm so sick and tired of him always being right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's really funny. That'd be great if that were if that were what they were complaining about. Always have to be right. A little Freudian slip on my part. Yeah. Okay. What are some other things that we or, or, or things that you complain about with men? Don't. Yeah. Don't hear the baby crying. Yeah. Exactly. What else? Okay. They don't have the same emotional needs. Does that ever translate into men don't care? That works. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not always. It may translate into other things, too. It would be different, but sometimes it's taken as a negative. What else? What else do you think of when you think of men? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, not considerate, thoughtless. Inconsiderate, okay? Yeah. What else? We as men, we're not shaping up real well, guys. Not real good here tonight. Yeah, what else, though? Lazy. Lazy butt. You know, there's a reason it's called the lazy boy and not the lazy girl, okay? All right. <laughs> What else? It's a good list. How about women? What are the what? How do we usually characterize women? Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Emotional. Hormonal. Thoughtful has to be right. <laughs> Gossipy. What was the other one? Passive aggressive. Passive aggressive. Has to be right. Pardon? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, sweet, amazing. Yeah. Controlling. Nagging. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's already heard. Your, your reputation goes far. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So. <laughs> exactly. What else? Describe the ladies. Multitaskers. Multitaskers, yep. Emotional. Yep, emotional. Multitaskers. Repetitive. Repetitive. Yep, we got that. Repetitive. Uh, multitaskers, yep. Long winded. Long -winded. <laughs> Some of you guys are going to be paying for it on the drive home. <laughs> Detailed. <laughs> That's actually an interesting point. Is that, the, is that more likely, you're right, who would pay for this, the men or the women? The men would pay for these comments. The men just accept this. We've actually gotten pretty comfortable with the culture of male bashing. We're not going to do that tonight. We certainly have, there's been a long history of female bashing, you know, and male dominance. So we, uh, we don't want to have either one of those. But we're going to really learn to talk about the men and women differences as tremendous assets that we have to learn how to use. But anything that we miss, either of you wanted to have on these lists for men and women? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nurturers, women are nurturers. Providers. Protective, aggressive. Okay. More competitive. Okay. All right. 
Nicer. Women are nicer. All right. What was that? Women are patient. Oh, nicer to your face. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Any other roles or differences men, between men and women? It's a good list. It's a good list. And the realities are is that a lot of these are true and a lot of these are misinterpretations, although they're still there. And some of them, um, there's always going to be exceptions. So I want to make sure that while we're talking tonight, we're going to talk about for most men and for most women. But there's definitely going to be a lot of variation from person to person to person. Okay. So in our in our family care, how would you how do you describe me as the man, you as the woman? What ways do do you take on some of the masculine characteristics, and what ways do some I take on some of the feminine characteristics? Um, you're more nurturing. I'm more nurturing. Okay. I like the kids better, she says. I don't know. I'm more willing to get in people's faces, I guess. Kara's more willing to get in people's faces. She tends to be more of the aggressor. Uh -huh. so, there's, so there's no one, all men are this way, all women are that way. I hate those types of just glomming into things like that. So I, don't want, to, I want to make sure that we steer clear from that, that we use this. So if you, if you kind of go, well, I'm not that way, just go, of course you're not, because you're you. But... Um, a lot of this you'll find will be really useful as we're talking about how to bridge that gap between each other. Now, part of this, to really understand men and women, we need to understand our history. Okay, Why are we different? What's the real purpose? And if we go back anciently, there's a lot of wisdom for the difference, and the wisdom is basic survival. And this is all based in the idea that typically men were the hunters, Okay, we had larger muscle mass to be able to travel longer, to be able to, uh, to actually use weapons, to fight, to kill, because we needed protein and meat and fur and bones and all of those things to survive the harsh environment. And not just we needed it, our whole village, our families, our tribe, we needed it to survive. And in this brain, it's not just the outward physical mass, and the brain is set up to, if we talk about women are multitaskers, well, men tend to get this laser focus, right? When we're right on something, that's what we focus in on. Because if I'm a hunter, and I'm hunting down an animal, I need to be following very carefully where the footprints are. If there's a broken twig here or there, I need to pay very close attention to the trail and track it very carefully because if I miss that trail, we die. There's no Walmart. There's no grocery store. There's no butcher. We're it. And if we die, our families die, and that's unacceptable for survival. So I have to keep a laser focus. And if I'm looking around and getting distracted by other things and looking at other things and multitasking, I'm going to miss the trail. This is unacceptable. So the male brain is designed for a much simpler focus. And that's not good. It's not bad. It's functional to um, job, speci uh, what's the word? Uh, job specification or differentiation between, you know, so that we can you know, basically do just some job sharing. And in the female brain, where they developed as the, as, the, as the gatherer, if you're going out there, because the meat and fur isn't enough. We need, we need berries, we need fruits, we need nuts, we need, especially we need crucial medicines and herbs and things like that that are going to also help us survive and even keep us from dying in certain areas or ease our pain or our sickness. And so if I am a gatherer, if I go gathering in the woods like this with a single focused mind, I'm going to miss everything that's over here. So with a gathering mind, I need to be able to see everything and not miss the detail. And see, if this plant's here, that's probably an indication that this other plant that I need usually grows in clumps in proximity with each other. So I know that if this is here, then this is going to be here. And if the sun's this way, then the moss is going to grow this way. And I'm going to be able to find all these types of things in the different times and places and seasons. So all these different parts that seem totally disconnected are all related. And so women need a multitasking brain that can pay attention to that. And so having the men do that job and the women do this job allowed for our ancient people to survive. 
and you go back 10,000 years and you look at our DNA and our brains and all of that type of stuff and our bodies, ain't nothing different. We haven't changed. The only thing that's changed is our, our cultures, our, our, uh, our governments, our religions, all kinds of things have changed, but our biology has not. And that's crucial if we realize that then if biology doesn't change, maybe we should pay attention to biology because the biology doesn't change because it hasn't needed to. It's functional. And it has a purpose. So the problem is if we keep trying to get men to be like women and women try to be like men, we're going to miss the point. Okay? People sometimes talk about getting in touch with their feminine side. Guys, I don't have a feminine side because I don't have a vagina side either. Or you don't have a penis side. If you're a woman, there's a reason for the difference. But there are wonderful things that men bring. That's why women are attracted to men. There's wonderful things that women bring. That's why men are attracted to women, outwardly but also inwardly. And we've learned in our culture, which is hypersexualized, to be all about the outward attraction, that we've learned that that part is attractive. But we haven't really taught how attractive and how to be attracted to and how to use those internal differences that make us uniquely male, that make us uniquely female. When we understand that, we can really use it. So in her brain and in his brain, we all know about the two hemispheres that we have. Well, what connects the right and left hemisphere is this little bridge, and it's called the corpus callosum. And, in the, and this connects, this shares data back and forth between the two hemispheres. And in the female brain, this corpus callosum is four times larger than it is in the male brain. Yeah. Now, I know this, you should feel good about that. I mean, you have more brain going on up there. It doesn't have anything to do, though, with, with, with smarts. What was that, Mitch? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, smarts. It has everything to do with data processing. Okay? And so imagine like a four-lane highway versus a one-lane road. Okay? It's, they're going to get a lot more stuff through there. There's a lot more data going back and forth. And it's, it's crucial because... If I need to be able to track all of this random dislocated information, this extra processing power is going to help me do that if I'm a woman. And so when we talk about them being multitaskers, if we talk about them being detail-oriented, okay, um, long-winded, that has to do a lot with the talking. Okay? Men and women, of course, we know they communicate differently. We'll get into those communication styles here in a little bit. Um, but um, any questions anybody has as far as just the basic neurolo neurology of how the brain goes together? Okay. Now, so that's, that's what's different in the female brain than the male brain. And the male brain up here, women have this too. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's the part uh, the, in, the, in the front part of our brain that has to do with how things fit together in space, spatial relations. Okay, and in the male brain, it's two times larger in the male brain that it is in the female brain. Okay? So this has so spatial relations has to do with how does this piece fit with this piece? And then I'm going to put those pieces together. Okay? And so if you see uh, if you uh, when, when when our kids were little, okay? I, I thought I was pretty, you know, I really wanted to make sure that I saw the, all the ways that women were stereotyped in in our society, right? And I worry about that. I try to be pretty progressive and all that. So I was like, uh, my girls are not going to have Barbies, and my boys are going to play with, with dolls, and babies, because they're going to learn how to nurture too, and stuff like that. And uh, we, I couldn't keep the Barbies out of the house. And well, my boys, my, my my first son Adam, he did play with the doll, and he learned how to nurture. He definitely is a Lego kid. And I tried to get the girls to play with Legos, and they would dabble in it, but it wasn't an interest. And a lot of that has to do simply with those two parts of the brain. Legos are all about how this piece fits with this piece. Now, anybody, any of the guys here play with Legos? Any of the women here play with Legos? We got a woman over here who plays with Legos. How about any of the guys who like to put things together? Okay, my boy back there. That's my boy Matthew, by the way. He's part of my tech crew. We always they always bring a drag a kid along, and then we go out to dinner afterwards and a little treat. So, and any any girls play with Legos besides the vet? Okay. Only if you're playing with your kids, okay? So now, if you guys play with Legos, could you search through a whole box of Legos and find that one little piece that you needed? Yeah. Because you're very good 
at sifting through all the parts that you don't need. And you tune them out. The other parts that you don't need, if I need this piece and this piece, I need another connector piece to hook them together, I can look through thousands of Legos and ignore every single one except the one that I need. That's hunting. Okay? Now, if you're talking to a man as a woman, and you're sharing tons of information, what's the guy going to do? Track all the information, or what is he going to look for? Nuggets. Nuggets. Chunks. Pieces. And how does that fit together? And everything else that you're talking about is extraneous, not necessary, unimportant, useless details that don't matter. Question. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so the, the one woman in our group who is a Lego player, she, as she goes through them, she sorts them. Okay, whereas a lot of guys will just discard them. So this goes into the female gathering. The sorting is the gathering. Okay. And so you, while you still have, well, you have that part where you, tend, you may have a larger spatial part of the uh, spatial relations part of the brain, like a man does, but you still have a female brain. And so it still has to find ways to gather and put things and, and kind of see how they relate to, relate to one another. So when a woman, so when, when I try to keep the, the Barbies away from the girls and stuff and let them be, you know, all equal kids and things like that, if you put, it's, it's, and it's fine to do that. It is fine to teach kids that they don't have to be stuck in a stereotype. It is still good to do that. But if you were to take, you know, 20, uh, you know, four-year-old boys and 24-year-old girls and put them in a room with blocks and, and dolls, most of them will gravitate as you expect them to, simply because of that. Because in the, in the female brain, to play or to communicate or to interact without relating, it's, 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 it's almost impossible. Because if you have these two hemispheres and you have all this information going across, you need to be able to share information from one side to the other. Well, what's inside, I don't care whether you're male or female, what's inside is what comes outside. All right? So if you have this need to share information back and forth, you can't share information back and forth between Lego. But between dolls, you can. And so this is where it gets really frustrating for women because as women have all this data to share and all these parts that seem to us as guys disconnected and unrelated, they all relate to the woman and they all make sense and they all connect and they're all a part of the story and a part of the processing that needs to happen for the connection to occur. And this is what will drive women nuts and when they're talking to a man. You're sharing information and you're met with no feedback, what does that do to you? Yeah. Have you guys ever been on Google or on the internet and you've tried to find something and you search and it's dead on the other end? Okay. In computer talk, when a computer sends one message to the other, before they even do anything, they send a ping, ping, to make sure the other one's there. And then that one sends a pong back, pong. And then it says, okay, we're connected. Now let's share information back and forth. So we type, dear Google, how are you today? I would like to find out this about that. And, and then it returns all this wonderful information to us. And it's like, oh, fantastic. We expect, when we put a request out there, we expect from Google to get tons of information back. Well, that's what women are looking for in their communication. And we, as guys, we're sitting there going, this doesn't matter. How is any of this relevant? I remember one time when Kara and I were first married, she was, uh, Kara always likes to tell me stories. She's always got a million stories, and it's always fun. We've been married 20 years now, and when she can tell me a story that's new that I haven't heard yet, because she has no problem telling the same story over and over and over, because they're always infinitely entertaining to you, you know? <laughs> and, um, and I usually like hearing them, just so I like being with her. But every now and then, she'll come with a new story I haven't heard before. But when, when we were first married, there, all the stories were new. And I can't even remember what the story was, but she was telling me, some story that occurred, and I don't, even, I don't remember all the details, obviously, but what I do remember is all of a sudden she would tell me, well, me and my sister, we were going to go do this thing, and, and well, see, it was a Thursday because we, were, we had to stop by the mall and we had to pick up her paycheck, and then we had to, no, actually, it was actually Wednesday because, because of this, this, and this. Yeah, no, it was actually it was Thursday. Yeah, it was actually Thursday. And she's going off on this whole other tangent about what, and this was something that happened when they were teenagers. Like, who cares what day of the week it was? What relevance does that have to the story? Okay, I, I, I couldn't comprehend. And I, was, I felt myself drowning in extraneous data. 
and and I and and it, it just became overwhelming. And we and so when we we came this got the short code where I just asked her just just give me the nuggets. What are the what are the essential pieces that I need to know the 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 the, the bullet points of the story? And I didn't realize that those bullet points are fine. But have you ever read a book that has tons of details? And you can read a, a Cliff Notes version of that book and get the bullet points, but miss the whole feel of it. Well, that's what women are doing. They're talking in story, and that story paints a picture, and it gives a context, and it fills the whole thing out. And it's a wonderful way of communicating. If you're a woman, okay, and it's really hard for us as men. And there's not one way that's better or different, but this is the whole point of tonight: is how do we learn how to actually bridge and do what each other needs out of a deep respect rather than just frustration. Ah, men, women, jeez, here we go again. We get frustrated with each other. All right. Talked about that. Um, the, I just skipped the slide, nature or nurture. A lot of times people ask, well, how much of this is built in? I think we clarified how much of this is built in. Of course, a lot of it, and that's the nature part, a lot of it is also in our nurture. How are we raised? Okay, now there are definitely, I work with a lot of men and a lot of women who are raised with horrible messages about what it means to be a man or a woman. And we usually get really limited messages, okay, about what a man can be and what a woman can be. And so um, I want to make sure that we're not locked into any of those, okay. Um, and a lot of the things that we tell men, for example, are don't cry because if you cry, you're a what? Wuss. A baby. What else? A little girl. Yeah. With a little girl with pigtails. <laughs> yeah. We get, we get called a lot of things. We even get called even worse names and even very um, uh, uh, derogatory names for women or women's anatomy. Okay? And that what we're teaching is that not only we teach boys at a young age to become strangers to their tender emotions, and then we also teach them that to show those tender emotions is to be a girl and to be weak like a girl. So what have we just taught boys about being boys? And what have we also taught them about girls? What have we taught girls about girls? Girls are weak because they show emotion. Now we tell women it's okay to show emotion, right? It's okay for women to cry. Or is it? As long as it's not around us, as long as it's not around us right? Yeah, that's so true. I love it. It's actually honest because that's how a lot of guys feel because we're, we're, not, we're not taught how to get comfortable with it because we're, we're taught to be so uncomfortable with our own tears, with our own emotions, that we become strangers to our own and we don't want others around us. And so we tell women, on the one hand, they can cry and that it's okay to cry, but then we say, we tell you, we say well, you're, now you're being over-emotional, you're being too emotional, you're being hormonal, or you're being histrionic, okay? And so we send these really goofy messages to both men and women about emotions. When the truth is, physiologically, we have these neat things called tear ducts right here in both brains, in both heads. And I don't care whether you cry every day or whether you, are, you haven't cried since you were five years old as a man, maybe. Those tear ducts will still work if you let them. And remember, biology has been around longer than any of our current cultural norms that say, don't cry to be a man. Biology has been around longer than that message. So which do you think has more wisdom? A transitory message that culture imposes upon us? Or biology that hasn't changed one bit? Okay. Now I want you to think about the power of biology for a moment. Think about any time that you've had a really super busy week that you had to have so much done and had to get things done and you got the flu. Which one out, your plans or biology? Biology takes over. Biology will always win. So if we can pay attention to our biology and use it rather than fight against it, we'll get along better. So what happens is, now, women, any, any women here who've used crying as a coping strategy, ever use it like when you're having a really rough time, okay, and you just let the tears flow maybe with, by yourself or with a girlfriend or a sister or a mom, okay? How does it feel? What, is, what does crying actually do for you? Relief. De-stresses. They feel better. 
the argument that we as guys have been taught is that why cry because it doesn't what? Yeah, it doesn't accomplish anything, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't change anything, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't fix anything. Okay, and the thing is it's not designed to fix anything. What it does, the reason that it provides the relief and eases your stress and you feel better is because what it does when you cry in the female brain or the male brain, it releases endorphins. And endorphins we've heard of, but a lot of people don't realize that endorphins are actually occurring narcotic. They're actually in similar in their chemical makeup to heroin and morphine. Okay? The only difference is there's zero negative side effects to endorphins. It would almost be kind of nice if they were a little bit stronger and be like, man, let's go cry, dude. <laughs> yeah, you don't really get off on, you know, on a nice uh, cry high. But um, that's something that in our culture, in our society, we've taught men don't access a built-in coping strategy that will help you manage the stresses of life. That sounds like a dumb message when you put it that way, doesn't it? Don't cry, that sounds manly. No, it actually is stupid when we, di when we dissect it. Okay, so I'm not saying that we have to all us guys get together here and do a group hug and you know start doing primal screams and, and cry here tonight, but just this idea of let's just be a little bit more open to exploring as men and women how we interact with our emotions and how we respect the emotional differences. Okay, any comments or questions before we move on to the next part? Okay, great. All right, anything from online yet? No. Let's see. Now, one thing I want to mention as far as whether we take and make this personal or not, again, these differences, if once, once we understand, and, and we'll get into some really neat things here about the male-female differ differences even further, if we understand that this is normal for most, then we don't have to take it personal anymore. Too often, the conflicts we get into, we think are, between Jonathan and Kara. And some of those are, but a lot of them are explained because I happen to be a man and she happens to be a woman. And if I, as a man, chose to be with a woman, doesn't it make sense to learn that operating system and operate within that operating system? And if she chooses, as a woman, to be with a man, doesn't it make sense for her to learn how men work and how men operate? It just makes sense. But too often, I've had so many couples is it was sitting across from me and they're going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and I'll just start laughing and they'll say, what are you laughing at? You know, and I'll say, well, you guys, you guys are thinking this is a personal thing. Well, it is. This is really, it's caused us a lot of conflict for many years. I said, I know. And it's really unfortunate because this is normal for most. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? I said, like, this is normal for all men. All men do this and I explain, they do the whole brain thing. And all women do this and I explain the whole brain thing and they go, oh, well, I never realized that. So they spend years in conflict over things that were actually never personal, that were actually just different. Okay, And if we understand that, we can knock out a lot of the conflicts and a lot of the communication problems when we realize, oh, it's just different, it's not good, it's not bad. And then the things that really are true personality conflicts or true personality issues, then we can have more energy to attend to those rather than having everything be an issue all the time. It allows us to be more efficient and effective in our, in our, uh, our um, conflict with each other. So as we're talking about gender culture now, we have, we have woman land and we have man land and we have womanese and we have manglish. And I like this analogy as opposed to the planets because I've never traveled to another planet, but I've, I've been to other, other places in the world. And if you've ever been to other places in the world, you expect difference. That's actually one of the reasons you go there. You go there because it's different. You think about when you're first courting and interested in each other, the attraction is because they're not me. They look different from me. They have a different body style and type. They have different attachments on their body that I like that intrigue me. They have all kinds of... <laughs> People are looking at me like, what? Okay. They have... They have different, they, they look different from me. He looks more rugged, she looks more smooth. I like these things, okay? We're attracted to the difference. And then oftentimes when we find the difference, we go over and we spend enough time in woman land or man land, we spend a lot of time going, oh, men. Jeez, can you believe all these things the way they are? Women, come on, nagging, repetitive, long-winded, men, poor listeners, bad communicators. 
And what we end up doing is we end up offending our hosts in the, in the country or the culture that we're visiting. Not realizing that what we need to do is we need to do this. We need to bow. I've never been to Japan. I'd love to go sometime. I love Eastern culture and Eastern philosophies. And my understanding is that when I go there, I'm going to be doing this. And I'm going to be taking my shoes off when I enter their homes. But can you imagine if I went over there and said, Hey, how you doing? What's up? I'm not taking my shoes off. In America, we wear our shoes wherever we want to wear our shoes. So I'm not taking my shoes off. <laughs> Jabs. Okay. Right? Can you imagine? Yeah, that's not okay. I would, I would be seen as rude and prejudiced, racist, and ignorant. Okay? And pompous. Right. Yeah. Catch a samurai sword of the neck. Because Japs is considered an offensive term. But we talk about women, ugh, women, ugh, with the same tone. Men, ugh, the same tone. And yet we're not offended by that. That's normal. Because men and women are so different. You can't live with them, you can't live without them. Do you say that about other races? Or hopefully we've evolved enough that we go, you know what? That's not okay. And even if you do think that, most of us know we can't even say it out loud. So we don't use the N-word, we don't use the J-word like that. We don't use other derogative, pejorative statements about other races because we realize that's just dumb. And so now I think we can take it to another level with our genders and realize there are unique differences. Men are raised differently. Women are raised differently. We have internal differences that matter tremendously. And so when I go to Japan, where they are, live in a culture of respect and honor, I'm going to try to, when I go there, I'm going to try to learn. I'm definitely not going to use the pejorative J word that I used. I'm going to be more than willing to bow. I'm going to be willing to take my shoes off. And I'm going to also be so willing to learn that I'm going to be aware of my ignorance. I'm going to be very careful to not offend, right? I'm going to be also be very willing to learn from my Japanese hosts who they are experts on being Japanese, right? So if I want to learn Japanese, whether language, culture, food, experience, I'm going to actually go there and let them teach me, right? I'm going to be open to that. But how often when we go into man land or woman land, do we sit there like this? <laughs> That's not the way I do it. That's not the way I do it. But your way is stupid. Try going to another culture and doing it that way. It doesn't work. And I've heard this... Some of you know me have heard this example before, but if I go into, uh, couples will do this all the time, well, that's just not my way. And I'll say, well, who cares? I mean, I care because I care about you guys, but as an argument, well, that's just not the way I am. I hear that argument a lot. And my answer to that is I don't care, unless you want this solution, which is a good solution. If you really want to do it your way, then I would say don't be together as a couple, separate, get a divorce, buy a mirror, and talk to the mirror. I think it should be like this. Well, I think it should be this way too. You do, you're so smart. No, you're so smart. Who's handsome? You're handsome. The best. You'll never have an argument again, okay, ever. And there you, there you have your solution. But if you choose to not be with yourself your whole life and choose to be with another person, then bow and be receptive and be taught. Let a woman teach you what it's like to be a woman. Let a man teach you what it's like to be a man. I had a woman, I had a, uh, it's a young woman, she was about 17, dragged in there by her parents, not wanting to be in counseling, horrible relationship with her father, unfortunately, and um, she just ticked off. She says, there's not one man on the planet who understands women. I said, I do. I know exactly what women want. And she goes, yeah, right. Now I sound like a, some cocky, arrogant therapist slash male who thinks he knows everything. And I said, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly what women want. And she goes, yeah, I'll try it. I said, I said, the way to interact with a woman is listen to what she says and believe her. Period. And she's like, that's a really good answer. Well, I said, yeah, it's a really good answer because you know what? You know how I learned that answer? Because for the last almost 19, 20 years that I've been doing this, about two-thirds of my clients have been women. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them over the time have told me 
that their problems are that the men don't listen to them and don't pay attention and don't really accept their influence and don't believe them. They get ignored or argued with or whatever. And there's a lot of other things that women want for, for, to be sure. But to just listen and believe and not fight. Well, when I go into another culture, if I go to Japan, that's actually what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be listening and believing. If a Japanese person tells me this is how, this is how the Japanese function, I'm going to believe them. I don't need to argue and fight. Then if there's a difference, well, then we can work on it and negotiate, but I'm going to negotiate respectfully. And if we start with this mindset or reset our current relationships to this mindset, then we'll start finding a lot more respect because we'll be bringing respect into it instead of having that nagging voice in our head like, huh, men, they're like this. Women, they're like this. Yes, comment? Uh-huh. Okay, so say you're, you're and your husband are having this conversation and then your husband's not agreeing with you and it's his way. So you say, all right, let's do it your way. Then he starts arguing with you and you're agreeing with him and trying to Right. How do we actually how do we actually negotiate those differences? Yeah. yeah. That's actually I'll I'll touch on that briefly because that's a really great question which takes me and my clients sometimes months to negotiate even sometimes the simplest thing. But the, the basic understanding is once we start with this, this is kind of the starting place to that. Okay? There's actually one of the workshops I do is called the, the, marriage prep, the marriage prep workshop where we develop an hour way plan. And the strategy is very simple. It's a great question because we can, we can bow, but there's still going to be differences. And there's still things that need to be worked out. And to do that effectively, we have to start in a very different way than what we normally do. Because what we normally do is we, we fight for our way, my own my, my way, or fight against your way. And so what we do is we do a simple three column sheet. We write down her way. We write down his way. Um, whatever topic it is that you have, write that in there. And then the task is to Basically, let him or whoever wants to talk first, let him or her talk and write down all the ways that matter to him. Just write it down with a core assumption. And this is usually what gets lost in most negotiations. There's a core assumption that whatever is coming out of his mouth is only coming out of his mouth because it matters to him. That's a safe assumption. Yes. Uh-huh. Right. So by getting it down on paper, as opposed to talking this out, talking it out, we lose a lot of things in translation. A lot of things get lost. We, 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 uh, we mishear things. Miscommunication is happening all the time. Just as a side note, when it talk about communication, a safe assumption you can make is that most communication is miscommunication. And if you make that as a core assumption, you won't be surprised by it. You'll expect miscommunication to occur as opposed to how, how, could, how, could, how could you misunderstood that? I, I clearly stated was on my mind. So he'll say one thing, he'll say another, but when we write it down and we can both see the exact same words, that helps us actually clarify further. Okay, so, but anyway, we'll go through. So we list all these things. If, it ma if it's coming out of his mouth, it matters, it's important, period. There's nothing to argue with in this list. There's absolutely nothing to argue with. Whether you agree with it 100% or you think it's the stupidest thing on the planet, that is not, we're not in evaluation mode. This is just like classic brainstorming. If it matters to him, it matters to him. And then we do the same thing with her. Whatever comes out of her mouth is the most important thing in the world because it matters to her. That's all that I need to know. And then, maybe out of 10 items here and 15 items here, there's only one item that they both agree on. Out of 20 different things. And this becomes our way. And this is where I no longer care 
about how you feel or how you feel. The rule for our way is it's our way or it doesn't play. We have one way of doing it. There's one way of playing football. You don't use hockey masks, baseball bats, volleyball nets. You don't show up to the game to play football. Those are fine for other things. These are fine rules for her. These are fine rules for him. But if we're going to do our marriage, our family, then we have to figure out our way. Otherwise, we're going to spend all the game time arguing how to play football. No one, well, where I grew up, we used a baseball bat. Where I grew up, we had the, 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 the playing field was this wide. No, it has to be this way. No, we did it this way. We spend all the game time arguing the rules. Okay? But negotiating this, there's a lot of things to it because it's not as easy in reality than it is as it is on paper. It takes a lot of work to work through that. And to get people to actually listen that respectfully to each other it is a hard thing to do. To get people to listen to the point where they actually, what I teach people, that, that the solution is not the resolution. I don't want people resolving their problems actually when they come to couples counseling. I want them to stop trying to solve their problems and I want them to start listening deeply and respecting the differences. Then we can work at changing. But usually people are doing the exact opposite. They're trying to change everything and then I'll accept you. We need to do the other. Not just because it sounds good, it's what the research shows. The interesting thing, it's a paradox in counseling. But the research shows it's very clear that when we get couples to try to accept each other and get to a place of understanding with each other, change blossoms. When we focus on trying to change each other, change halts. And so it's not just a nice idea of let's just respect each other and communicate better and just be all cozy and friendly. No, it's a strategy that gets results. Yes? Uh -huh. way. And 90% of the time when it comes down to our way, we end up fighting about our mm -hmm. way. That's supposed to be different. Right, so that just tells me that there's more work that needs to be done. I'm really solidifying this because this is, a lot of people have told me the same thing. Well, yeah, Jonathan, we've done that. And I know, but it's not until it's so clear. Because the thing is, here's how you tell when you're. Yeah, well, here's how you can tell when it's clear in your guys' relationship. If it's so clear that you actually have it written down, you have you basically have enough of these little sheets of paper, you got your own little playbook, that it's so clear that there's no confusion where the white line is on the football field. You've never been to a football game where they've argued where the white line should go. And when couples are arguing where a basic line should go about how are we discipline a child this way or who's doing the dishes, then we haven't clarified the white line. We're still arguing the line. Okay, so if we're not there yet, that's okay. A lot of couples have a hard time nailing this down because we're taught in every part of our life we need clear structure. If you want to get a bachelor's degree, you have to do all of these requirements and there's no shortcuts. If you want to do relationships, well, if you love each other, it'll all work out and it'll just be fine. If you want to have, I mean, and we put so much of our heart and souls into an education. But none of us expect our diploma to keep us warm at night. When it comes to our emotional education, our relational education, we take whatever society gave us, whatever our families gave us, whatever it was good, bad, indifferent. And even if it was good, I can guarantee it's not what your partner was raised with. So we have to develop some way to get in the middle. So this is really, I'm going to stop going on this topic. I'm so glad you brought it up, though, because it's a very common one. This is this workshop here. Is preparatory to that process, or and it's certainly you don't need to do this one necessarily. Some people want to do it formally; others just work it through through their conversations. Whatever works for you in your relationship is fine. Okay, but when it comes to this, this is the way of getting really respectful of these different ways. Okay, so they, they all kind of mesh in; all the strategies play off each other. Okay, well, there's... skip that. So bridging is the strategy we use here. So I. As I talked about earlier, I don't have a feminine side, even though I have feminine aspects that I tend to be more of the nurturer. Like I said, I like the kids better. <laughs> and she's just being joking because she loves the kids. But I, I, tend, to, I tend to do more. Of, I mean, I'm the one who, I mean, if, if anybody asks what the kids want for Christmas or their birthday or anything else, everyone knows to come, they come to me because Kara never knows, right? 
And she doesn't even care. And she doesn't even care. And in most relationships, it tends to be kind of flipped that way, right? And so, but the truth is, I don't have, as I mentioned, and it may seem crass to you, but it's actually just a, a, a biological reality, is I don't have a vagina side, right? I am man. I am man outside, I am man inside. So if I'm going to Japan, with that analogy, I don't have a Japanese side, even though I really admire the Japanese. You do? <laughs> well, there you go. You have to have Japanese. So I don't have, as much as I admire the culture. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just about as, as plain white Caucasian as you can get. Okay. But I can bridge over into the Japanese culture. And I haven't been there yet, but I've definitely read everything on Taoism I can get my hands on, everything on Zen Buddhism I can get my hands on, and everything on Confucianism I can get my hands on. And I love a lot of the cool technology that comes out of there too. So I like a lot of that stuff. So I can go over, I can bridge into that world, and I can explore it, but I don't like sushi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't. And, uh, but I like a lot of the other food there. So I can bridge over there and try different things and take certain things on, leave certain things, and I can come back over into my white male Caucasian world and go, cool, I've got all this extra stuff, and I'm still 100% American, and I've got all this cool Japanese stuff too. Nice. I like it. Okay. So I've grown and become a, a different, better, more full, f fully f uh, filled out type of individual because I bridged over into that other culture and because I'm willing to be open and bow to that culture and to those teachings. Okay. So when we go into, you start interacting with your spouse and your partner and you start feeling that irritation come up, ask yourself, am I irritated because he or she is really a jerk? Or am I irritated because there's a real difference here? And am I maybe irritated because of my own prejudice that I'm bringing into this relationship where I'm seeing that he or she should be more like me? Okay, that's a prejudice. Or am I really open to, this is very different. We're going to have a relationship here. We're going to have to spend a lot of time negotiating and working these things out. And the best diplomats are the ones who truly understand the other culture. Okay? In real diplomacy, they have to really understand the differences there and really respect them tremendously. Okay. So one of the big areas, of course, is sex. This is a big uh, conflict area for a lot of people. Okay. That's why I love my job because I get to talk about sex a lot. And uh, so if you guys will turn to, I don't know what page it is in yours. I've got an older version here, but the sex page, one of these, uh, sex and intimacy. Okay, page four there. All right. So we'll just kind of look through some of these and tell me which ones kind of resonate to you, which ones you think are kind of interesting or you would agree with or you would disagree with on this, on this, uh, on this graph. Crockpots, do you agree with that one? Yeah. So that women, uh, on warm-up speed, that women are sexual crockpots and, and men are sexual microwaves. Okay. You never have to really start a guy up, okay? You know what foreplay is to a guy? Nothing. Look at me. You happen to move. Oh, your head turned. Oh, wow, foreplay's done. Okay, can we now move into other things? Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so for, for men under foreplay, foreplay's nice. I mean, a lot of guys aren't opposed to it, but it's definitely not necessary, you know? And some guys are a lot more open to it than other guys aren't. But for women, it's nice and necessary. It's actually necessary for the female sexual response. Okay, And this plays out big in a lot of relationship issues. Okay, So if you think about how complicated the female sexual response is compared to the, to the male sexual response, okay, it takes a lot more to warm a woman up and to actually... I mean, have you ever heard uh, under, under orgasm, have you ever heard of a man faking orgasm? Huh? I don't think they can. I, I, I mean, I'm sure somebody has. There's always an exception to everything. Okay, but men have orgasm 100% of the time. Okay, and they never fake it. Whereas orgasm for women, the percentage of how often they have it varies frequently. I mean, it varies. Excuse me, it varies greatly. From some women have it all the time. Some women have never had it. Okay, and some and uh, and and some fake it. Okay, and so because a lot of that is because the female sexual response isn't attended to. And this plays out in other stuff that has nothing to do 
with, at least in our guy's mind, as sex, because if we're just hunting sex, nothing else matters. But for the male, but for the female brain, where everything is related, I always tell guys, foreplay begins two weeks before sex. Okay? A few smiles on the women's face, interesting. They know this, okay. And, and I know this as a guy because women, I've listened to and I believe them, because I don't know what it's like to be a woman. I never will, but I listen to them and I believe them when they tell me this. Huh, maybe women know what they're talking about. If every single one has told me the exact same thing over the last 19 years, maybe they know what they're talking about. Good tip, men. Pay attention. <laughs> this is good. Um, and that I've also said things like doing the dishes is sexy, changing diapers is sexy. Okay. I, uh, if you've heard that Bruno Mars song, Grenade, I'll take a grenade, I would take a grenade for you, all of that. When I first heard that, I started laughing. I'm thinking... You know, there's always these big grandiose songs. I'll, I'll climb the highest mountain, swim the deepest river. I'll do all these things for you. You want me to take out the trash? Yeah, I'll get to that later. You know, I don't know any woman who wants the, the, a, 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 their guy jumping on a grenade. That doesn't happen in real life. Take out the garbage when I ask the first time. Will you please? That says that you tune and don't know. You can't know. The problem with Kara's here, the problem with Kara is here is that now I have to be honest. When she's not here, I can be like the best, most amazing man on the planet. Damn. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so um, but by tuning in, and, and the way this plays into sex is for most women, if he can't tune in to the big obvious stuff like the trash is overflowing, and I've, women, they talk about women being repetitive. Well, when they have to ask over and over and over for basic tasks to get done, really, and guys, honestly, at work, if you work outside the home and the manager is asking you to do the same thing over and over and over again, that leads to disciplinary action, and we all expect it, right? But at home, when the household manager or the family manager is asking us to do something, it doesn't matter. We put it off. She's just nagging, you know? She's just going on and on about it. But instead... So in the, the woman's mind, whether she's consciously thinking about this or not, if he can't attend to the big obvious and tune in to the big obvious stuff, how on earth is he going to tune in to the very small, very sensitive aspects of the female sexual response? And then he's upset that I, don't, as a woman, don't want sex? Well, gosh, if I'm not going to get any pleasure out of it, why would I want sex? Guys, if you didn't ever get any pleasure out of it, would you want sex? If it was just always a chore and you maybe 10% of the time it felt good? Really? Yeah. So if we understand that, we go, oh, wait a minute. This is how everything is going on here. So if I'm attending to things in the relationship with the kids, with the garbage, with that, that sends a message that I can see things. I can attend to things. I can take care of you. When it comes to sex, I can take care of you, and it'll be good. Women don't mind sex as much then. Now, they're still sexual camels. <laughs> okay, they can go a little bit longer than we can. Okay, sexual jackrabbits. The thinking about, actually, women on, on, on average, some a lot more, some a lot less. On average, women think about sex four days out of 30. On average, men think about sex 30 days out of 30. Okay, so there are sexual libido differences. And these change, these aren't static, they change over time. These are averages. And there's always exceptions. Yes, comment? Yeah, well, there's always exceptions. So like I said, that there's, in, we're talking about in general, but there are definitely plenty of times where I've had plenty of uh, uh, couples where the woman has the, has, definitely has the strong sexual libido and the guy's interested in it, you know, maybe once every month or two. And that's not abnormal. And the thing is, that's really interesting. It's not as common by any means, but it's not abnormal. And I was talking to a, a woman who she was really frustrated. She got very demanding of her husband. And I'm like, and she couldn't understand why he wouldn't want sex. And I said, welcome to man's, the life of a man. Okay? This is, and I'm sorry for her. I wasn't trying to be flippant with her. But... It's for, for men. It can be very frustrating. And if you're a woman who has a strong libido, it can be very frustrating if your man doesn't. But this is not an abnormal thing. There's usually, it's rare for two couples to be equally matched with that desire. And if some are, that's fine. That's wonderful. But most aren't, and that's okay. It's not pleasant, but we work through it. And if we understand it as a normal difference, as a what the heck's wrong with her, what's wrong with him, and the typical thing, so in some situations, like you said, it's flipped, 
But either way, whether it's flipped or among the you know the more common, if we start labeling things with prejudicial language and pejorative or negative derogatory language, like, uh, well, he's just a pig because all he thinks about is sex. Well, she's just cold and frigid. Well, how is that going to help the situation? It's definitely not. So we have to be careful with those things. And if we realize that these are normal for most, and if any of these are normal for you, even if it's flipped, if these are normal for you, start calling it normal. You can still negotiate it and work through and talk about, well, I would like this, well, I would like this. Okay? That's fine. We can still do that, but start from a place of deep respect. And that's what I talk about bowing. Bowing doesn't mean bowing and giving in, and I'm going to do it your way. It's not bowing down in a sense of subservience and one's dominant, one's submissive. And the picture of the two Japanese women in kimonos bowing is they were both bowing to each other. It was an equal respect, an, each, an equal um, giving to the other person. Okay. Any other comments when it comes to sex, intimacy? Okay. When we understand this, what happens is we are able to use, we're able to get beyond sex and actually experience intimacy. A lot of, uh, unfortunately, um, intimacy gets, men and women get really horrible messages about sex and intimacy. And oftentimes because we live in a hypersexualized society that is also at the same time sexually ignorant and sexually repressed. I'm not talking about Utah, I'm talking about our Western culture, okay? We, we, every, every Cosmo has, you know, you know, 75 ways to drive him wild in bed. Does that put any pressure on women? Okay. Do you know how many ways, women, you need to drive a man wild in bed? you know what the most sexy thing you can say to a man to really turn him on? Yes. Okay. Will you have sex with me? Yes. Whew. Okay. That. You don't need. You don't. But the message of these magazines and the culture that we're around in this hypersexualized society is that you, as a woman, are not enough. You need to do all these other things. And it's not just doing these things that drive a man wild in bed. You need to get your body to look a certain way, right? Because your butt's too much this, your thighs are too much this, your, your rear end isn't enough this, your boobs aren't enough this way, whatever. You're not enough. 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 As a woman, by yourself, you're not enough. That's a really sick and twisted message. And it's out there all over the place. Body image issues are a huge thing I deal with in my practice. With young women, with old women, with married couples, with single people. It's huge. Okay. And if we can start saying, you know what? No. I am enough as a woman. And my woman is enough. I don't need her to be more of this. I need her to be more her. Okay. When we tune in this way, we start getting away from just sex. We start tuning into intimacy. We realize that sex is just one slice of the whole intimacy pie. But lots of times, for some men, if we learn, if all we learn is there's, okay, I'm not allowed to cry. I'm not allowed to show weakness. Um, I have to always man up and be tough and just deal with things. And I can't be a wuss. And I can't do this. And I, so I, I have to shut off all those emotions. But the one place where I can be vulnerable, the one place where I can be weak, the one place where I can be exposed is in physical intimacy. Okay. Guess what I'm, I'm going to want more of? Because I still have all those emotional needs. Our emotional, our emotional ways we show emotions are going to be very different, and some of our emotional needs are going to be different, but a lot of our emotional needs as men and women are the same. We crave connection. That's the human common denominator. And most people, as Henry David Thoreau said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Most people feel alone and disconnected. That's what intimacy is meant to solve. And physical intimacy, that one slice of the intimacy pie is fantastic. But it's just one slice. And if we, if we become so hyper-focused, as so many songs, TV shows, and movies in our society are, that sex is, if you have great sex, you have a great relationship. Well, the truth is, as a marriage therapist, I can tell you there are plenty of couples who have great sex and they have crap relationships. I know a lot of couples who have kind of, meh, sex. And they've got awesome relationships. They're just not really that sexually great. It's not that often. But you ask them, they're like, yeah, our sex life is great. Because their relationship life is great. Their whole intimacy pie is filled out. So when I have all these other slices, when this one isn't there, it's like, oh, it'd be nice if that was there more, but all this other stuff is fantastic. 
I don't need it as much. So sex isn't just about sex. Sex is the outward physical aspect of connection, where we literally are having a physical connection between male and female parts. Intimacy is about how do we connect emotionally? How do we connect relationally? And if we understand the interfaces between the two brains, then we can interface better. If we stop expecting difference as a bad thing, and we can start accepting difference as a good thing, we could go a lot farther in that. Any other comments on sex or intimacy? Okay. Oh, actually, there was one other thing I did want to mention that we didn't touch on, is that in the female brain, this is where, where sex oftentimes becomes a barrier and a conflict point, is that typically, well, as I mentioned, that what men and women both want is they do want connection, all right? We both want it. Is that women, though, oftentimes want to experience the emotional connection first, and as they feel that emotional connection, that's why I said, you know, uh, foreplay starts two weeks before sex, and, you know, all these other tasks and chores equal foreplay and whatnot are sexy to a woman. That shows emotional connection. When the emotional connection is there, then that drives them to wanting to have sex or at least be open to receiving sex, okay? But on the male side, is oftentimes we'll ex we want sex because through sex we're able to experience that emotional connection. And neither one is right or wrong. They're just different, okay? They're both two ways of getting it, but sex oftentimes gets in the way. It gets in the middle there, and it becomes a barrier and a conflict point between the two instead of something to pull us together. And so all we need to do there is really just practice our bridging skills again and go, okay, wait a minute. If I want sex as a man, not only tune into what our emotional needs are, ask her, what is it that you need from me emotionally? And I'm not doing this just as a strategy to get more sex, but if I do, that wouldn't be, I wouldn't be opposed to it. But it's, but really I'm just curious, what is it that you need? Because you know what, I think you've probably been telling me repetitively the same thing over and over and maybe I haven't been really listening. Or I've been listening but I haven't been believing. Or I've been hearing but I haven't been listening. Or maybe I've just been completely ignoring. And I know you may have said it a thousand times, but tell me again. And this time I'm going to listen, I'm actually going to take notes, and I'm going to really practice that. And then just see if anything happens sexually. The interesting thing, even though I do a lot of sex therapy, the actual truth is I don't teach a lot of sex techniques. Okay? I know them. I've read the books. I teach my clients them when they need them. But the truth is, most couples don't need techniques. They need this. And then whatever they end up doing in their own techniques usually ends up, it works out fine on their own. So it's usually not a, a, a technique problem. It's usually not something they need to read in Cosmo. One more way to have epic sex. I saw that that's, uh, this month. Epic sex. Man. So not only, but you, you, not only does the guy finally convince you to have sex, okay, and you finally conceded, okay, I said, well, have sex. Now if it's not epic, again, you're not enough. Sorry, because you failed. It was only good sex. It was only great sex. But it wasn't epic. How do, you, how do you mean epic? Oh my gosh, talk about pressure. This is ridiculous. Okay. Am I the only one that this bothers? Okay. I'm not, I'm not opposed to epic sex, FYI. But I'm just, you know, I'm, not, I'm just saying, let's, you know, not overcomplicate something that's meant to actually just be very natural and just work with each other. So we need to remove these barriers. So if we, but from the, from the if I have sex in the way here, and I'm a man, sex in the way and I can't get to her, then the only reason I can see her if I'm not careful is cold and frigid. And if I'm the woman and all he does is he keeps wanting to have sex with me, and then all I see him, he, all, all he cares about is sex and he's just a pig. Okay? But if we realize, oh, wait a minute, she, she's seeking emotional connection. She may be cold because she needs to be warmed up. Okay? Maybe he's not a pig. Maybe he's hungry. Okay? Maybe he's hungry for emotional connection. How can I give that to him? How can I give that to her? Okay? And sometimes you can do it subtly, sometimes you can do it right out there in the open and just say, hey, what do you want? What do you need? Let's talk about this. Okay. Uh, let's go into communication here a little bit. Okay. Good. Great on time. Okay. Communication, some of these things we've talked about, but I want to clarify when it comes to the data transfer. All right, we've talked about how we communicate, some women can communicate so much more and men really want more chunks. So when we look at these two columns here, for men, less is more. Okay? It's not that what you're saying isn't important. It's that, that they can't hear it. They can't hear it. Physiologically, four lanes of data. Have you ever been in a bottleneck in traffic? 
okay, where they've closed down three lanes and there's only one lane left. Only so much can get through. So as a woman, I'm not saying edit yourself in a way that censors yourself. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to, if you have something that's important to you as a woman that you need to communicate to your man, I want you to have a voice. I want you to speak your mind. I want you to say what matters to you, of course, because we are equal and you have a right to say what matters to you, as does a man we both do. So say it. So I'm saying edit, not because what you're saying is too much. It's too much for a man. And if you want to be heard, and what you say actually is important to you, edit it so it can be heard. So if all the cars can't get through, send the cars through that you want to get through. Okay? That's the use of it. So for men, though, if we're going to want to have a good relationship with a woman, think about as you're handing out chunks, okay, of data, ask yourself, how can I how can I dress this thing up? Imagine like your chunks are the bones of a skeleton. And that you want to really, now you got the bones, you got the basic structures, you're going to share something. Think about how many details can I add to this? Can I put some muscles on it? Can I put some flesh on it? Can I put some clothes on it? Can I put some accessories on it? Okay. Can I even put some makeup on this thing? Can I dress this thing up? It's still, the bones are still in there, but the other stuff matters too. And so there have been plenty of times that I've come home from work or something, and, and, and Kara's asked me about my day. And my, you know, how, my, how was my day? My, my initial thought is it was fine, right? Because it was. And, but I've learned that that's not enough. And Kara's actually pretty easygoing and stuff like that. But I've learned that, you know, it's, I, I'll ask myself, okay, it's fine, but what was fine about it? And I don't, I, I'm not going to repeat the whole day because I don't have the mind for that. I don't have the patience or attention. But I think about... I know Kara. I know the things that she's interested in. I know the things that she likes. I've, we've known each other for 20 years in our marriage, but 25 years as friends. What are the things that interest would probably interest her from my day that might be interesting or valuable data or information for her that may not really be necessary in my mind, but that might have something to do with a relationship or an interesting story or this, that, or the other. And I think, okay. And she's not really asking for a lot because she's really learned how to that less is more with, with us guys. But since more is more, I'm like, okay, I'll just give a little bit of information. Because I could come in every day and say, fine, 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 fine. And after that, after 20 years of that, what does she have to hang on to with the relationship? Fine. Yeah. There's no connecting between. It would be like going to Google each time and saying, how, you know, how, what's the weather like today? And you get no response back other than fine. What's the capital of Nigeria? Fine. <laughs> What's the square root of whatever? Fine. It's, you, you, after a while, you stop using Google. Anybody use Ask Jeeves anymore? Oh, yeah. Does anybody actually use Bing? Really? Okay. No. We use Google because it works. Okay? And you get what you need from it. And so if you're going to be with a woman, give her data. Give her lots of it. Okay? Let her know that you're there on the other end. Okay? And they'll respond. Okay. Questions or comments about that? So as it reads here, for women, less is painful to women. More is painful to men. Okay. With women, details painted with a full color palette. Men, bullet points. For women, the journey is the point. As Kara was telling me about whether it was Wednesday or Thursday, I thought, we're never going to get this story finished. Well, the point of the story wasn't to get the story finished. The story of the story, the point of the story was to go on a journey with me. We're just having a conversation. Okay, and there's value to that. We understand that when we're driving along. Sometimes you're driving along, you're trying to get from one place to the other. I remember I used to drive up to Park City four days a week. And, I was, and I'd always just like, trying to get just up to my job. And then one day I realized, I looked around and I was going up driving up Parley's Canyon. And I go, holy cow. Yeah, I'm driving up one of the most beautiful canyons in the world. People come from all over the world to drive up this canyon to go skiing. And I get to go up it every day. Huh. And I really had a much better commute that day. And I started paying more attention as I drove to not just pass it. So there's a lot of value in that. And you can, I learned that from going over into woman land, that there's, the journey is the point. I still like to get to the point, but I've learned how to really be comfortable with just enjoying the journey. Comment? Uh huh. You know, like ask questions instead of just like, oh, 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I like that. Rather than rather than just take what you can get, you can ask for more, but not make it a negative. Oh well, he doesn't want to share with me. Obviously, he obviously doesn't care. That's one interpretation I've heard a lot of women make. Instead, it's just like for you, you're like, oh, I want more. I'll ask for more. You know, and you're not, you know, beating him up to get it. I mean, I don't know when she asks. Is it okay if she asks, or does it drive you nuts? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Right. As long as it's not too many questions. Okay. All right. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so with this, as I mentioned with the dolls before, that women are going to externally process to problem solve when it comes to how they how they get to solutions. And I remember lots of times when Karen and I were first, you know, together as a couple. I would oftentimes try to just get her to solve the problem, and she told me, I don't want you to listen, I just want you, I mean, I don't want you to fix me, I just want you to listen, and which every woman has said to every man on the planet. And once I, and I don't always do it, but the times that I do listen well, the reality is, is that she ends up coming to the same solution I would have come up with, or maybe even a better one, you know? And that, the need to verbally process because there's a need of sharing back and forth between the two hemispheres that need to process with another outward person and I'm the most important hemisphere of our relationship excuse me the most other important person in her relationship world okay she has other important relationships that matter but I'm her primary second half right there's one half here one half here one half here one half here this is these are the two halves and so for me to be there and let her verbally process allows her to problem solve, okay? And that's really helpful and essential for women to be able to do that. We as men tend to like to cave. You've heard of that. We tend to, we tend to want to just kind of internally process and just kind of figure it out on our own and just kind of ruminate and stew and just be with it. And there's nothing wrong with either one of these, but they're very different. It's very frustrating for men if they keep asking, women keep asking, well, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? We say nothing. And that's never a good enough answer. It's like, well, sometimes just let us be there. We need to spend some time just be alone. It's not a reflection. We're not shutting you out as women. We're just like, hey, I just, this is how I process. I internally process. External, external, it doesn't matter. But they are two different types. Comment? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah. Huh. Wow. I love that. I never even knew that. That's fantastic. So, I mean, really, we're practicing, you know, even just getting those talking muscles moving more. Yeah. Even that early on. Yeah. That, that's fascinating. And it really, really fits with that. So, another one here with, with is uh, um, with, uh, with listening. We talk about listening is the fix. When, when, cause when women always say that, well, you know, I don't want you to, I don't want you to fix me. I just want, I just want you to listen. That's true, but the problem for men is don't ask a man to not fix. That's what we do. So to ask a man to not fix and just listen is to ask him to not be a man. So what I teach men is that listening is the fix. You still get to fix. Just listen. Don't give the solutions. Don't give the answers. Just really just let listening be the way of, pro of solving the problem. And through the external verbal processing, she'll come to her own conclusion. And when she's done talking, if she doesn't have to come to the conclusion, if she hasn't come to the conclusion, you can ask, well, I have some ideas. Would you like to hear those? You're using me just to just listen and just be there. You can clarify that if you're not clear, because sometimes we're not clear as guys. And sometimes women really do want our feedback. Sometimes they just want us to just shut up and listen. They just need a sounding board. And you know, sometimes they might not even know until they process through some of that what they really are wanting. Okay? And so, but with men, 
we want solutions. We want answers. We want to get to the point. Okay. Um, when it comes to fine, what fine can mean? With men, it means fine. Okay, fine means fine. With women, it means fine. How are we doing fine? It could mean not fine, right? It could mean so not fine. It could mean you're dead to me, okay? It could mean any number of things. But when you ask a guy if he's fine, I could, be, I could give you the answer of fine even when I'm having the crappiest day and it's still true. Because if I'm an internal processor, when I go in, if you ask me as a woman if I'm fine, I mean, how are you doing? And I say fine. What's going on internally is this process. I'm going through my mental checklist of all the issues and tasks and problems and things that I have to attend to. And I go, okay, well, this one, this thing with the car, there's nothing I can do about that till Monday. So for now, that's fine. That's all I can do. I've got a plan for it, but nothing I can do about it now, so that's fine for now. And this problem at work, nothing I can do about that until I retire or find a new job, so I guess that's fine. You know, There's nothing I can do about that. And this part over here with the kids really is fine. We've had a great day today. It was really nice, so that part's fine. So really, so uh, fine, 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 and all that's internal. And then when you ask me how I'm doing, fine. And it's actually honest, even though I may have real legitimate problems going on. So that's where, just as men, so when you hear that, don't get frustrated. Like, like Kayla mentioned, just draw out a little bit more. So and what things are fine? What things are on your mind? What's bugging you? Oh, nothing. Okay. Well, I know you. Yeah, I know sometimes you stress and worry about some things. And, and even say, well, you know me personally, but also you know me as a woman. It does help if I get some, if you could kind of dress up that skeleton answer, you know. Give me a little bit more details. Paint a picture for me of what fine or what nothing means. Okay. And instead of making it a challenge, oh, you never share with me. You never communicate. You're a bad communicator. Now here's the. I'm going to bust that myth really clearly for right now. To get really clear that men are great communicators. Okay. They're the best communicators. So Mitch, say you and I are going on a road trip together. Okay. All right. And I'm driving. You're in the passenger seat. And. Uh, um, actually, I'm going to back the story up. I'm going to come back to you in a minute. Let's say you two are driving, okay? And you're driving, Mitch, and you're in the passenger seat, and you ask Mitch, are you thirsty? And you say no, and you pass an exit, and you pass another exit, and he passes another exit. What's, ha what's happening to you? That's what it really means, okay? You, so you know her well enough, that's what it means, okay? All right, so she's communicating something else, but she's, she's actually checking in. She just sent a ping over, right? Are you thirsty? Check in there, no, but she's expecting then to hear, are you, right? And you'll say, no, but I do need to stop and use the restroom, okay? And then the loop's complete. But if you don't do that over and over and over, for a lot of people, they get more irritable, more irritable, and then, then all of a sudden you're in trouble, and, and you don't know why, because now you're an insensitive jerk, because how could you have been, not been more clear? I mean, you were just like, hey, this is, what, this is how you communicate. You check in with each other. It's just obvious. So the way that she communicated as a woman was totally perfect communication for women. It's crap communication for men. They know how to play ping pong, but they don't communicate this way. So, for example, so now we'll go back to Mitch and I in the same car, driving down the road, and he asked me, hey, Jonathan, are you thirsty? Oh, actually, that, that actually would never happen. He would say, hey, I'm thirsty, pull over. Okay, he wouldn't even ask. Okay? I got to pee. Yeah, we're not going not gonna to ask. We're literal. It's just going to be right out there. There's no hinting. There's no guessing. There's no relating about it. It's just, and it's not that this way is better than the other, but from male to male, there's no miscommunication. It's perfect communication. I don't need him to ask. I don't care. He's going to tell me. I don't care how he feels. I do care how he feels. If he's my friend, of course I care tremendously how he feels. He'll tell me how he feels. And if he doesn't tell me how he feels, you know what that means? He doesn't want to tell me how he feels. That's all it means. It's not good. It's not bad. But we communicate perfectly. Uh, I, once a year I go with my buddy Steve up and help him work on his cabin. And I remember one year after we went up there, uh, Kara asked me afterwards, I come home, and she's asking me all these really great insightful questions like, so how, how is, how's Carrie doing? How are the kids doing with this and this and this and this? And she's asking me all these questions. I'm thinking, these are really insightful questions. 
about a friend that I've, I've known as long as I've known Kara, and, and I really care about his family, and I love his family, and I'm thinking, I have no clue about any of these really meaningful, important things. And she says, so what did you guys talk about? And I'm thinking, well, substantively? Things that had value? I don't know. I think we talked about girls and cars and sports. And, and, and we're not sports guys, but tools. We talked a lot about tools and building. Yeah. Movies. Yeah. Yeah, just dumb guy stuff. Locker room talk. A lot of locker room talk. Okay. You know, just ridiculous things like that. Nothing of value. And yet, we're not bad communicators because I can guarantee as far as the relationship goes, if I had a serious problem at 3 a.m. in the morning, you know who I could call? I can guarantee he'd be there for me if I needed it. Right. <laughs> You'll be asleep. You're like, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. i got to watch out for that. Sorry, guy. So it's these little things there that, that from men, male to male communication, they're great communicators. Female to female communicators are great communicators. And it just as we know that men are bad communicators when they communicate to women. But you know what? Women suck at communicating with men. So I've had, for example, this is the scenario I get a lot. Women tend to be the ones who seek out counseling more often than men do. Okay? So without women, I wouldn't be able to feed my family. Thank you so much. Okay? They tend to be the relationship managers. They tend to notice when there's a problem in the relationship first. They tend to attend to these things earlier on. Which is, which is good because sometimes we as guys aren't paying attention to these things. We don't necessarily always like it, but we oftentimes need it. And so they're coming in, and they're, they're the ones making the phone call to me. And I'm asking, so is your, is your husband or partner willing to come in? And he goes, well, he'll, he's willing, but he doesn't want to come in. And, and he's not going to talk. And I said, well, don't worry, he'll talk. And I said, well, Jonathan, you don't know him, though. He won't talk. And I go, oh, okay, okay. And I hang up the phone, and I know he's going to talk. And so he comes in, the guy comes in, and he's a little hesitant, doesn't necessarily want to be there and whatever, but he's willing, and, and he's giving it a shot at least. And, and so I, I, I start asking him, so what is it that you want, you know, if we kind of, you know, do the banter and stuff. So, so what is it that you wish could be different and better in the relationship? He kind of sits there and thinks a little bit, and I don't know. It's fine, I guess. Well, I guess that, you know, I, I want this it would be nice if this was different, or I, I don't like this, or if, if we could have this type of relationship, this would be great. And as soon as he starts going into that, you know what she does almost nine times out of ten, what the woman does? <laughs> that's not what you want. If that's what you wanted, you wouldn't be doing all these things. Well, if that's how you really felt, then you wouldn't be doing this. If you really felt this way, you would do this way. And blah, 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 blah. And guess who takes over the conversation? Guess who's fixing his thinking? Guess who's fixing his emotions. Yeah, women are just as bad of fixers as men are when it comes to listening. Women don't listen to men, and men don't listen to women. It's actually both women and men are horrible communicators when it comes to going to the opposite sex in the intimate relationship, at least. Maybe in the workplace we're great or other areas, but in the intimate relationship, it's it, it's pretty even. And that to me is so it's not a criticism of men or women. It's a recognition that these are naturally different styles. Karen and I were having a big fight once in years ago. I can't remember what it was about. Probably something I was doing stupid. And we, we, were, we were yelling and not being very Christ-like or anything else. And it was on a Sunday after church. I do remember that. I think I had given a nice talk in Elder's Quorum about love thy neighbor. And it was a real, we felt the spirit in there, and it was really powerful. And everybody thought I was a great guy and teacher. And, and then we're in there just saying horrible things to each other in our bedroom. Not saying, I think it was yelling, screaming at each other. And um, not, not a proud marriage and family therapist moment, and, but a real moment that we can all relate to. And, I, and she's going off on all these things. Okay, I me mean, not realizing that this is what's going on, that there's all these extraneous details. And in a fight, extraneous details become nasty, right? There's all these different things. And I finally shout at her, what is it that you want? that you really want. And she shouts back the stupidest, most intelligent thing, which was, I just want you to be a woman. Okay, Which is stupid because I can't do that, obviously. I can't help you. But it was very intelligent in the sense that she's saying, I need you to get this. And I wasn't getting that. I was stuck in this. And there's, again, there's nothing wrong with this. Male mind is a great mind to be in. But she really needed me in that moment to bridge and be here. Okay. All right. 
So um, I think that's the gist of it for now, guys. Is there any other comments or questions anybody had for any of this? Yes, please. No, no, not at all. <laughs> What do you mean? Not become your primary way of communicating that. Like if I'm always supposed to be going, okay, I need to be like this, but that's not who I naturally am. Mm -hmm. How does that not just? It makes really good sense, and it's a really good question. So, how do I not sell? Out? How do I basically not give up myself? Yeah. How do I maintain who I am? I love it. I love it. But how do you really do that without no one else? You should just right. Well, no, I'm still a rainbow. You just try really hard to be right. It's, it's such a great question. How do we find that balance then? And so using, going back to our man land, woman land, manglish, womanese, the Japanese example I've been using, okay, is I haven't lost anything. I've been studying Japanese culture and, and philosophy mostly, not so much culture, but definitely the philosophies and especially the Eastern religions from that area. And some of the martial arts too, uh, not more theoretical than physical, okay? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, uh, for since I was 16, okay, and I'm 43, so almost a, a, almost a third of my life, two thirds of my life, okay. I don't feel I've lost any bit of me. I don't feel that I've sold out my 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 country of origin, okay. I've been enriched. I'm more me, okay. Going over into learning how to really do this, I don't lose myself. I gain more of her in my life. So for example, I remember one time I came in just burned out, fried from a long day. I didn't have anything to give to the relationship. I remember Kara was doing, getting ready for the night. She had some, I can't remember, some, some big deal day going on at work or something. And she was telling me about it. And I'm sitting on the edge of the bed and I'm just doing this. Uh-huh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh-huh. And she comes out and she laughs at me. I said, what? She goes, you have no clue what I just said, do you? I said, honey, I'm sorry. I really, I apologize. I really, I really wasn't tuning and listening. She said, you know what? It's okay. It worked. I really, it, for this, I didn't really need feedback. I just needed to have someone to bounce things off. And it was a real awareness for me to realize that, wow, sometimes just being willing to respect the culture enough, instead of me just going, staying in me to the point of, you know what? Hey, I've had a bad day. I don't have time for this. I say, you know what? I don't really have enough processing power, and that is authentic for me. I really can't go fully into this world, but I can at least bow to it and respect that and give some of the head nods and some of the attentive listening outward motions, and it worked enough. And she could also respect my world and say, you know what, I realize he's a man. Not like he's a man, but he's a man, and it is too much for him. His brain's overloaded right now. Processing power's in there. I appreciate that he put in the effort for me. And the truth is we don't lose ourselves. There's a fear of that, though, and I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people are, we hang on to our ways, our own ways so much because we've had to fight so much in relationships for our, our turf and our ground. This type of work is about getting us out of that, that we don't have to fight for position anymore because if I'm spending my time fighting for your way and you're spending your time fighting for my way, what happens to defensiveness? Too often we're fighting for our own ways and we're fighting for our own ground that we're afraid to lose ourselves and sell out. That we don't sell out anything, we gain more. We gain so much more. We end up not selling out, we end up buying out <laughs> the other. Okay? And we find that the men become so much more open to the relationship. Women become so much more uh, open to or giving or whatever. We just become more. The idea is to really fill ourselves out. Because I can't get in touch with my feminine side, but I can get in touch with hers. And, and in the female land, there are so many good things that as a man that I need. Not just her sex, not just the things that she can do for me, okay? But the things that she is that are uniquely female that I can only get if I enter that world. 
and really learn how to tune into things as a man that I might not otherwise tune into. And because of that, I become, a, I become more of a man. I become more filled out. Okay? Become more filled out. <laughs> and the same thing with women. Okay? There are things that I've gained, that she's gained, not just from male, female, but from our personalities. Okay? I grew up in a very conflict-avoidant home. She grew up in a very conflict-aggressive home, okay? in some ways. With, um, and that was a big oil and water mixture for us. And so what I've learned is that when I used to think all conflict was bad, I've learned that some conflict can be really useful. And so I've gotten more comfortable with conflict, even though my natural style is to still I'd rather not have it. But I've learned the utility of it. And Carrie's learned also ways to come around conflict in different ways. Okay, rather than just a head-on, she's found that other ways work better for me. Things like that. I don't think that diminishes her or diminishes me. We now have more tools. I guess really this long-winded answer <laughs> is think about all of this going into the other person's world. It's like going from store to store to store, getting more clothes, more accessories, more tools. It's like going to, to Home Depot. Home Depot is great, but Lowe's has some things Home Depot doesn't have. Lowe's is better. Lowe's is better? Okay, well, there you go. You would know. <laughs> it's got me. It's got you. It had you at Hello's. Oh, that was bad. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. I should be shot. Okay. But um, I don't know if that answers or attends to that or not, or, or did I, what did I miss in your question? Okay. All right. Great question. And we'll go ahead and end on that. Um, just really have fun and, and really treat this as a language with each other. Um, treat it as a language that you have to develop fluency in over a long period of time. Okay, I'll just end with one simple story of paying attention to, as you're communicating with each other, remember, does anybody here speak a second language? Okay, so I, I, I did missionary service, thanks, honey. I did missionary service working with the Hmong, which are a uh, Southeast Asian refugee group um, who uh, relocated to, Cali uh, to California, Northern California, after the Vietnam War. And uh, they had genocide orders put out from them from the communist um, Pat Tat Lao and the North Vietnamese and they suffered so so much and I got to learn their culture and their language and they have an eight tonal language so Mandarin Chinese has eight has five different tones and um, Hmong has eight different tones and so what a tonal language is that you can say the exact same sound but with a different tone at the end and have it mean something completely different so in their language when you say, talk about the subtleties that we have to pick into with male and female, with Manglish and Womanese, these subtleties. If I were to say goodbye to you in Hmong, I'd say muhatua. And that means go and come. Go and come again. Hope to see you again. Go and come. Muhatua. But when I was first learning it, I, it, getting those tones was hard, and I was just getting the sounds, but not the tones. And I'd say muhatua, a little bit breathier at the end. Muhatua, muhatua. I'd say that tua, and that means go and die. <laughs> okay, it doesn't quite communicate the same message. Now, fortunately, because we were bowing to each other in their culture, they don't actually bow, but with the with the spirit of that bowing, we were bowing to each other. I bowed; but they could see I was earnest and I was trying to respect them. And they bowed to me and realized, "Here's an earnest guy who's just ignorant." And so they laughed rather than being offended, right? And then they taught me, and there was no hard feelings anywhere, and it just became a joke. You know, here's the, here's the young American who likes to tell us to go and die, okay? <laughs> you know, and if we take that same level of respect for the differences and for the miscommunications, and we take the miscommunications as normal and just say, of course, he's not getting it. Of course he's not getting it. Of course we're going to miss each other with this. We're learning two totally different languages and cultures. That's one of the biggest problems we think because we grew up in the same country and we're speaking the same language of English, we're thinking we're communicating clearly. We're just not. That's okay. So the more you learn here, this is just an education and that protects us. We don't, we're not going to lose any ground. We're going to gain more ground. It's like you don't lose knowledge when you gain knowledge. It's like when you get an ed education, it doesn't crowd out old knowledge. It just adds to what you already have and actually makes you a better, more fully rounded person. So I'll say to you guys, muhatua, and I'll thank you guys for coming. And I uh, hope to see you guys at another one. I think our next one is in January, and I can't remember which one that one is scheduled to be. I think it's, uh, I think it's the uh, it's either it's the Step Family Success one, or no, I think it's the uh, a marriage plan, the marriage uh, prep one. Anyway, if you guys are getting my announcements, you'll get those announcements, and uh, tell your friends and neighbors and all that. So thanks a lot for coming, you guys, and appreciate your time. All right. Okay, thanks. Okay.
need to put a big uh, applause track. We don't have enough enough in the audience so when I do this uh, recording. Oh yeah, everybody go scream! Oh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate you for coming. Woo right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> right. 